Good morning, Dr. Centeno. This is uh, Utkarsh from Network Capital. In this podcast, we try and demystify why people do what they do. Your career inspires us on so many levels. We're really excited to host you. Uh, you. Could you tell us, Dr. Centeno, about who you are and what you do today? Uh, my name is Miguel Angel Centeno. I am a professor of sociology at Princeton University, and I'm also vice dean of the Woodrow Wilson School, also at Princeton. Did you always want to be a sociologist and a professor at Princeton? Um, no, I, I, I thought about being a professor because I love to read and I love to teach uh, when I was an undergraduate, when I was in college. But I didn't think uh, I had enough money. I don't come from a wealthy family. And I always thought professors had to come from wealthy families. So I didn't really think about it until I was in my mid-20s. And sociology... I chose because there was a professor where I went to graduate school that I really admire uh, and I wanted to work with him and he happened to be in sociology. Fascinating. Tell us more. Tell us more about growing up and how did you end up in college and what happened after? Sure. Um, I, was, I feel this, a book can be written on it, but sure, try and tell us a podcast version. Um, let's see. I was born in Cuba. Uh, I left after the revolution uh, in 1964. Um, then we, my mother and I moved to Spain, where we lived for three years. We were stateless. We didn't have passports. Um, we were able to finally get an entry permit into the United States. Um, then we uh, moved where my mom was an adjunct teacher, uh, did not make very much money, um, at, uh, at, in Erie, Pennsylvania, which is a small ex-industrial town in, in Pennsylvania. Um, I lived in housing projects. I was fortunate enough to go to a Catholic high school, which was affordable for me. I made the money during the summer, and that gave me a very good education. And a cousin of mine had gotten into Yale um, and had gotten financial aid, so I knew about that, and that was my goal, was to get out of Erie and go to Yale. So I went to Yale for my undergraduate um, my mom then was very ill, so I spent a few years making money in business in New York. Um, didn't like it, but I had to make money. Um, what were you doing? I was working in advertising and in radio. Got it. Um, then I thought that I could get uh, uh, an MBA, uh, and that would transition me into a different kind of business. I went to Yale Business School. Um, I realized I didn't like business. I found it intellectually not very exciting, and I really was drawn to the academic life. And that's where I met again with this professor that I had had as an undergraduate. And uh, he encouraged me to apply to graduate school. I applied to graduate school, um, did well enough uh, to then get a job as an assistant professor in Princeton in 1990. And I've been in Princeton ever since. So... This, you worked, you paid off your debt, you took care of your mom, you went to business school, you didn't like business school, you changed track, and then Princeton happened. Yes. If you could look back and give yourself some advice, your career has turned out to be an inspiring one, but if you could give yourself some advice to your 18-year-old self and oh to gosh. your 30-year-old self, what would it be? <laughs> um, I think for, for both my 18-year-old self and my 30-year-old self, I would say try to be less afraid. Um, what did that practically mean for it you? Meant, it, I, meant, it meant that I was always, and I think this is true for many uh, persons who come from poverty, you're always afraid. You're afraid of going back. You're afraid of falling back into poverty. Um, you, 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 you don't see, it's very hard to see the world as full of promises. You see the world as full of threats. Um, and maybe that motivated me professionally, but it also cost a lot emotionally. I mean, I was always just sort of, uh, the best way I can describe it, and of course you can't see this on a podcast, but crouching like a boxer. Right. Um, and again, I think that can be very useful professionally, but it also takes a personal toll. Uh, so I think it would be the same thing for my 18-year-old self and my 30-year-old self of have more faith in myself, have more confidence in myself, and not be, not live life every day as if a tiger was chasing me, which is what, the, I lived my first 50 years 
basically fearing the tiger that was chasing me. First 50 years? Yes, pretty much. Even when you were teaching uh, at it, Princeton? Yes, I got tenure at Princeton when I was 40. But it takes a long time to lose that habit. Um, you know, again, anybody who has ever been poor, uh, you, you know, you just don't relax. Just because you know the tiger is no longer chasing you, um, you still look behind you all the time. You, you, you're, you're worried about the tiger, even if it's not around. Uh, and it took me a long time to realize. And of course, it also helped that, you know, I was saving money. I was able to be professionally successful. But that took a long time to calm down, to just say, it's okay, you can start enjoying life. And I still, and I think anybody who comes from poverty, um, has that sense that it could all go away tomorrow. Uh, I mean, it's less salient in my mind than it used to be, but it's always there. There's always the fear that something could happen and, and I'd be back to where I started. What is privilege? Privilege is... Security and safety. Um, for me, I'll, it may be easier to define first poverty. Uh, to me, the characteristic of poverty is, is not just the material issues. It's the permanent insecurity. It's the feeling that anything can go wrong and it will destroy your life. You will... Uh, there's a very famous movie uh, from the 1940s in Italy, The Bicycle Thief. Yeah where a family is destroyed <laughs> because a bicycle is, is stolen. Um, that's poverty, where anything wrong can happen. And privilege, and I can say this, this is something, um, in some ways this is what I've tried to give my children, is that sense of security, that sense of having walls around you, of having protection around you. And of course, it comes along with having money and having resources and going to good schools and all of that. But all of that pales next to that sense that nothing can go wrong, that everything will be okay. And that makes it possible to be much more ambitious. That makes it possible to dream of things that a poor person just would not dream of. Um, because you, you are certain inside your soul uh, that the tiger won't catch you. <laughs> and that's privilege. That's that sense of well-being, of safety. is, and it, and it can be achieved through economic. It can be achieved through a very strong family. It can be achieved through a strong network of friends. But that's privilege, that sense of security. Do you think now, uh, being a professor at Princeton and gone to all the great schools, uh, do you think you've overcome your lack of privilege? Oh, absolutely. I'm, I, uh, I'm one of the luckiest human beings on the face of the planet. Um, I have no... I, yes, I, I still have the fear, but I, I also understand that I am not just materially, but emotionally in terms of my family and my marriage and my friends, I am in the luckiest millions of, of the globe. Um, and I try to be very aware of that. I try every day... I'm not a particularly religious person, but every day, at least two or three times a day, I like to spend two or three minutes reflecting and just saying, uh, enjoy this. Um, enjoy this because this is a gift. This is a pretty great practice, uh, just being grateful, uh, thankful for what, uh, you know, what li the way life has treated you. Treated you. Uh, do you feel that uh, economic empowerment precedes social empowerment? That's or does a, it necessarily need to be one way or the other? I, that's interesting. I think you can have, if you're very, very privileged, you can have both. Um, if you're very, very unlucky, you can have neither. So both is you're part of an elite family and you have money and you have all contacts. Um, the bottom is uh, what happens to, for example, uh, many people who migrate to cities in the global south, where you're away from your social situation, you're away from your status, you're in this completely new place where you don't know anyone. I mean, think about it. Uh, someone from the countryside in, your, in, in, in India uh, arriving in Calcutta um, with maybe, you know, a thousand rupees, if, if that. <laughs> right. Um, 
and knows no one and has no job. That's the, that's the opposite. And then there's the people who are very wealthy, but um, don't have contacts, don't have what a sociologist calls cultural capital. That is the ability to dress correctly, to speak correctly, etc. And they are those... Who, is that very important? Oh, it's... Uh, for almost any career, um, I would say those sets of skills, which are often associated with money, but not necessarily. Um, they are separate set of capital. There is financial capital, that is how much money you have in the bank. And then there's cultural capital, which is just your ease with whatever situation you are, are, are in. And that can be as important as financial capital. Um, and then there are the people, and really interesting, and I think uh, many professions have this, where you don't have that much financial capital, but you love what you do, or your job is very prestigious. Um, uh, Princeton pays very well, so this doesn't apply to me, but I think for many people in the middle class, uh, particularly in the global south, not making so much money is more important, is less important than being able to wear a tie to work hmm. or um, having a certain status. Um, I think human beings, yes, we want our money, but we also desperately want that affirmation of status, of that sense that we are respected. Um, and there's many people with a lot of money who don't feel that respect. And I think it troubles them. But the, 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 there's a bunch of people who don't have that much money, but who feel comfortable in the situation that they're in and who are respected and who are given some status, some deference by the people around them. I wonder, are there studies that show that whose respect matters most to individuals? Oh, I'm sure there are. I'm sure there are. And it really, and it's going to, it's going to depend on, on, on certain biographies, certain cultural contexts. So in some cultures or for some people, their respect of one's parents. Hmm. If no matter how much money you're making, how successful, if your parents don't approve or your family doesn't approve, it means nothing. Um, that's just one example. Right. Um, there are other people who want the powerful to, to like them and to respect them. Uh, and so they want to be accepted by certain powers. Um, there are people who simply want the respect of their friends. Um, I think every, everybody's different. Everybody has a different set of components. Yeah, I call it your invisible audience. Yes, you're, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Your invisible audience to whom, I mean, certainly I do, and I think a lot of people do. We, we, look, we live life sort of as a play or as a film where we're watching ourselves living our lives and we imagine a bunch of other people watching us and we can imagine them approving and nodding their heads and saying yes good job you're doing the moral thing uh, or we can imagine a world where even if you are very successful that audience that you think is important disdains you um, I think this is this is particularly true in societies where they're make, uh, where people are making very large transitions or the society are making very large transitions. So I think one of the challenges for certainly in the, in the global south is if you come from a very traditional family and you become very successful in what we might call the modern or the cosmopolitan sector, yet your family doesn't approve. Uh, I think this is particularly very, very difficult for women. Right. Um, where... They might achieve a certain amount of success, but their family doesn't approve of a woman having this professional success. So they're caught. <laughs> um, they want to be their own person. They want so to even have in this... questions of personal choices. Oh, abs abs absolutely. So you know, you uh, let's take a stereotypical example. Um, uh, you might marry for love, and that gives you a certain satisfaction, but your family doesn't approve of your spouse. Uh, and you are caught in between. And I think professionally and personally, many of us are caught in between. If you can, if you can actually match your professional or social, uh, your, your professional material life, that is what you do for a living, etc., with the satisfaction of 
being loved by your family or your set of friends or your society, um, that is a privileged situation because many people have one but not the other. And some people have neither. Right, like, right. Um, what are some <coughs> of uh, the classes that you've taught at Princeton? There must be so many, mm. your research. Uh, the reason that I'm asking you is that I want to understand uh, how your students respond to them or how has the response changed? Oh, interesting. Um, let's see. The most popular class I teach at Princeton is a class I call it the Western Way of War, which is a sort of social science overview of what war means as a social phenomenon. And I start with the question of, I argue against the idea that war and organized violence um, is caused by bad people. It's not. If we depended on bad people to have violence, we would have a lot less violence in the world. I'm fascinated in how we can turn normal, ordinary human beings into these killing machines. And the course is about that. Uh, that's a very popular course at the university. I also teach a class on globalization, um, and particularly on the risks associated with globalization, how we have created a, a web of, of contacts, a web of supplies, a web of networks that is very fragile, and yet we depend on it. Uh, we depend, we're seeing this with the coronavirus. All of a sudden, no planes can land in Wuhan, um, well, how is food going to get to Wuhan? How is gas going to get to Wuhan? How are people, how are doctors going to get to Wuhan? Um, and I think we can see this. We can take the coronavirus and what's going on in Wuhan and Hubei province of, overall um, as sort of a, a sample of what it could happen globally. So I teach that class. Um, I'm also responsible for teaching the classical theory class in my department which is Marx, Weber, Durkheim, etc. That's always a lot of fun. Is there a lot of appetite for it? Um, I'm afraid the, the students have to take that to be graduate students in my department. So I'm not okay. sure how much appetite there is. <laughs> um, I try to make it fun because I think... I would imagine it'll be fascinating, right? Oh, it's, I, I think it is. I think you can read the classic 19th century authors. Again, the, the big three are Marx, Weber, and Durkheim. And yes, it's a different world that they're analyzing, although not so different. And the questions that they're asking and the way they're looking at the world, all you have to do is change a few nouns, and it's the same today. It's the same grammar um, about power, how you get power, how power is used, how um, does power flow from money, does power flow from position, does power flow from cultural position. That's what interests me. I guess I'm, I'm particularly interested in power. How is, it, how is it gained and how is it exercised? And I try to get my students, uh, many of whom, not all, but many of whom are very privileged themselves, to become aware of their own power. Um, that they, they're sitting in a position of power. They're sitting on a throne even if they're not aware that they're sitting on a throne. Uh, and One I, would say that, I mean, anyone studying at an elite university or a business school is, uh, oh, yes. is even, less unprivileged than one would have thought. Yes, even if you come, I mean, I always say this to, to, to students, um, even if you come from a very poor background, the minute you enter into Princeton uh, or in India, let's say, the minute you get into one of the ITs, <laughs> um, that's it. You, you're, or the minute you enter the, the civil service, whatever it might be, all of a sudden, yes, that background still matters, it still shapes you, but you are no longer the same person. You are now a privileged person. And along with that comes a certain responsibility that, you know, you have to, uh, I always tell the students, uh, uh, especially the undergraduate students at Princeton, many of whom are on scholarship. And I said, uh, I say to them, uh, Devote your life to the people who didn't get that letter, who didn't get that scholarship, because you are now one of the lucky few in the world. Uh. Absolutely. Um, how about the Woodrow Wilson School? The Woodrow Wilson School is just a, a fantastic place. Um, it, we try to... There's two parts of the Woodrow Wilson School. There's an undergraduate major, 
um, where you study a plethora of social sciences and you focus on a particular policy area and that's your that's what you do for the four years. Um, and then there is the graduate school where you get a master's in public affairs. And that is, I would consider, is the best policy school in the world. Um, I mean, I must say that at least thousands of people have applied from Network Capital to the Princeton Woodrow Wilson School. Oh, yeah. No, no. It's, 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 it's not only a fantastic experience, because what we do, as opposed to many other policy schools, we don't teach you the specifics of policy. What we provide is a set of rigorous tools which you can use to analyze any policy. And, and, it, and it's, it's more academic than many policy schools in the sense that all classes are taught by faculty who are in their disciplines. So you will learn economics from someone on the economics faculty. You will learn history from someone on the history faculty. Um, the other great thing about the school, it's very small, uh, so it's, it, it allows a great deal of attention. The other great thing about the school is thanks to the generosity of uh, the Robertson family many, many years ago, we are able to offer uh, a master's degree cost-free. Um, there's no tuition. Yep. Uh, and if you come from, if you're not particularly well-to-do, we also offer a stipend. So as opposed to starting off your career owing $200,000, you start off your career owing nothing, which allows us to focus on public service. Um, I think something like 75 to 80 percent, maybe even higher, uh, of our graduates go either to public service in the United States or wherever the country they come from, or a nonprofit. And they're able to do so because they don't have this debt overhang. Where if you go to many other policy schools or you get... Or a, business schools. Or, bi or I mean, business you, <laughs> schools, yeah. I mean, where you might want to choose, let's, you might want to choose working for a nonprofit or you might want to start your own company. But it's very hard to start your own startup when you are already two hundred or $250,000 in debt. I mean, that's... So we, we encourage students to use, again, that privilege of not having the debt to really pursue careers that have meaning for them, that they don't, um, and they, many of them make a financial sacrifice. Um, and that is, they could be making a lot more money twice, three times as much money if they chose a private sector career, but they're able to make the decision to choose a public sector career because they don't have to pay off this, this massive debt. No, that's such a. Uh, that is why so many of us uh, from Network Capital apply. Um, let's let's just do a thought experiment. Sure. You doing your MBA and you now teaching social sciences mm -hmm. um, at Princeton. Mm -hmm. What's the fundamental difference of environment? I ask this why because many of our community members often feel the need to make the choice right. between should I study X, should I study Y, should I study make a career in public services, or should I do it in private sector. You can do both, but uh, I just want to know because somebody who is an MBA as well as an academic and as, an, as somebody who didn't particularly enjoy the MBA experience, how would you com contrast these two? Ah, that's really interesting. Um, it's a different set of skills. Um, the more academic side allows you a very high level of abstraction. You can be thinking about things from a satellite view or plain view and just see it overall. Um, and you can also, and this is very important, you can also be seeing it without calling it into action. I think if whether you're in the public or the private sector, it's a very different, you, you have a set of problem-solving skills and every day is about solving the problem. Right. Um, it's often not that complicated of a problem, but there's a daily problem that has to be resolved. You have to manage a set of human beings. Um, managing human beings is one of the hardest things in the world, if not the hardest part of business. It's because it's no longer about you doing something well. It's about you convincing other people to do something well. Right. And that's very hard. 
And, and, Sociologists study this all the oh, time. Oh, yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, it, it, but, and, and this is where it really depends on your personality or, or what you prefer. There are people who are really drawn to that daily problem solving and that, um, uh, let's get this done. And there are people like me, I, I'm interested in that, and I've run this various things at the, at the university, but I'm really drawn to the more abstract intellectual uh, environment. Um, and, and, I, and I think there's, there's just two different types. And the public and the private sector, I think the big difference, well, there's a very big difference in terms of pay. That's obvious, and, and that, that's something we have to admit. Um, I think it really depends on if your motivation is from the process of management or your motivation is from the product of management. I think one of the big differences between public and private careers is with a public career, what you are concerned with is the product, providing health, providing education, providing some good, building some roads, providing a better infrastructure. That's what motivates you. I think in the private sector, there are some people who are simply motivated by money. Um, but yeah, there are some people who are motivated by, by money. But I think there's also a bunch of people who like the process itself. They don't care about the product. So I remember when I was working in business, um, I was in advertising and, and market research for consumer goods. And I would see people who had devoted 10, 15 years of their life to selling toilet paper or selling toothpaste. No one's going to get that excited about selling more toilet paper or more toothpaste. But you can get excited by the process of the sales, of the manufacture, of, of the thing itself. <laughs> and one can manufacture meaning. Yes, yes, exactly. You yeah. manufacture meaning and, and, and you don't, you're not really, you might be motivated because you think your product is the best, etc. But a lot of the motivation comes from, I want to just do this. It, it almost becomes more of an athletic event. Um, does anyone get life satisfaction from the simple point of hitting a football and having it go into the goal. No, it's just that's what gets you the points. <laughs> and I think that in, in, in business, and, and people need to be aware of that difference between caring about what the product is. I want to teach better. I want to deliver better health care. I want to do this. And I want to win. And the private sector is much more about wanting to win. Uh, and it doesn't really matter what the game is, but you, 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 you're trying to be number one, and, and that's their motivation. Yeah, I mean, that's why, I mean, uh, private sector, I mean, as default, one can say MBA mm -hmm. and policy degrees, the public sector, at least the way it's designed. Yes, yes, yes. Sure, you can do public service even after an MBA, but your debt may not allow you immediately. Right plus the incentive structure, plus the way the courses are taught. Yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, and, and I don't mean this in a derogatory way, I think the private sector, um, the, the product or what you are doing is often less important than how well you are doing it. In the public sector, it's, uh, it's the product itself. <laughs> Uh, it's delivering that good. Now, again, that can sound sort of derogatory and it can sound, you know, it, it, it's not. It's just what motivates you. Yeah. There, there, are, there are some people, there, there might be some people with incredible athletic talent um, who the idea of chasing a ball up and down a field and hitting it into the goal is meaningless. They simply cannot be bothered to do that. Be and there are other people who just the act of winning... <laughs> Just the act of beating that person at running towards the goal, um, that in itself has, has meaning. And I think people, when they're thinking about their careers, it's really important. Of course, there's the financial issues, et cetera. All those, I mean, some people are able to do that, or your family, or your responsibilities, or your tastes allow you to do something. By the way, I've, I've often thought uh, that we always think of if you want something, if you want more, you have to make more. There's another side to that, is if you want less, you can make less. <laughs> um, and I think 
people have to make that decision about uh, how much are they willing to pay for wanting things. And I think you can have a wonderful life uh, if you accept the fact that you're not going to drive a Mercedes, that you accept the fact that you're not going to have the latest whatever. The worst thing is if you are caught in the wrong career. If you have a if you have a career that's motivated by money and yet you don't really enjoy money, or you have a career that is not give you a lot of money, but what you want is a lot of money. Yeah. And I think people have to make a decision, fundamental decision in their young adulthood. What do they care about more? Do they care more about the thing itself, what they're doing? Or do they care at the end of every week or every month how much money they're getting? Yeah. And I think uh, the cohort effect is so important. Like your cohort, your classmates mm -hmm. uh, during an MPA, a policy mm -hmm. degree, mm -hmm. and your classmates during an MBA, mm -hmm. their motivation also rubs off on you. Yes. It can get really complicated that whose passion are you pursuing? You or your yeah. friends? Yes. Or yes. your neighbors or your mom and dad? Yes, exactly. And I think, again, this is where a few minutes of reflection a day or prayer or meditation or whatever it might be, is very useful to understand, this is gonna sound very philosophical, but human life is lonely. We are born alone and we die alone. That's the fundamental aspect of humanity, is our death is individual. That means that our life is individual and we, want, we, we have to be very certain that the life we are living is the life that we want and not a life for that invisible audience. Um, and that audience can be family, that audience can be society at large, so they see you as being very wealthy or very successful or something like that. Um, I know very few people who can be sustained by that audience. Yeah, long term, especially. Long, long term, you, you, you have to please your own soul. Um, so, you know, you can, you can achieve, you know, the, the number of, uh, just because you're driving a Mercedes does not mean you're happier. It means that you're driving a Mercedes. Now, if, if the act of driving and what you're doing to earn that Mercedes makes you happier, great. If you're doing it just to drive the Mercedes, you're not going to be happy. Yeah. It, it's, it's just not, and it's fine. If it, and I think different people have different amounts of one need or another. But I think in the day of our death, um, the final existential moment of our death, um, very few people, as they're dying, as the last day, as their last breath, is I wish I had made more money, or I wish I'd had more things, or um, I wish I had more pleasures. I think what we think about is, I wish I had given more love. I wish I had been happier in, in doing what I was doing. Um, a friend of mine uh, passed away. Um, he said, uh, uh, no one, no sociologist or no academic at their last breath thinks, I wish I had published one more article. Um, you don't think that. Or I wish I'd had one more car, or I wish I'd had one more pleasure. Um, they're, those are fleeting. They, they, they don't necessarily satisfy you. Now, sometimes you have to pursue those because you have to pay for something or you want to. Maybe your, your, your satisfaction is not necessarily pleasures for yourself, but some wealth for your children. That is rewarding. Uh, anybody who has had children knows that the same amount of money spent on yourself um, and that same amount of money spent on your child, you get much more satisfaction per dollar when you buy it for your child. <laughs> I mean, I'd rather, uh, I paid for my children's education. My wife and I could have an apartment in New York on what we paid. I'd never think of it that way. Yes, I could have an apartment in New York, so what? But I see these two people that I love very much and we have given them this. And I think we have to live life that way. If I, on my last breath, I'm not, going to, I'm not going to be saying, I wish I had taken that money and bought myself a yacht. Um, you know, the college application, mm -hmm. uh, in a way, also asks you to project your life forward, mm -hmm. right? Tries and reflect, mm -hmm. uh, asks you to reflect uh, what do you want and why in different forms. Mm -hmm. um, 
when you're a 20 year old or a 25 year old writing that, mm -hmm. what's the best way to figure it out? I'm not sure. Well, there's two things. I mean, one is the best way of figuring it out so you're happier. The other one is what you do to admissions. <laughs> My advice for, for, for students who are applying is be honest. Um, the people who are reading your admissions forms, for example, at, at uh, Princeton College, I believe the admissions office gets 30,000 applications, of which 1,500 will be successful. Now, these people read 30,000 applications, and they have read 30,000 applications for years. You're not going to be able to fool them. They can, they, they can smell it. They can pick it out. So if you say that you want to save humanity, da -da 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 -da, but you don't really mean it, they'll know. If you say what I really want to do is to make a billion dollars because I want to have the power of a billion dollars. If you're honest about that, that's much better. Do not lie. Than trying to save the rainforest example. Ex exactly. That... You, you, you can smell it. You can just, you, you know when, when someone is, is, is when you're, when, when someone is, and this is true in every human interaction, we can tell when someone is trying to just please you, uh, where they're selling you something. Uh, or telling you things that you supposedly want to hear. Exactly. And nobody likes to be sold anything. Yeah. I wish people who sell knew that. Yes, yes. And the best salesman, what is the best salesman? Someone who you think, or a best politician. The most successful politicians are ones where people really believe that they care about them. Uh, now, sometimes, if, if you're very good at it, you can fool people. Um, but it's, it's much harder to fool people than people think. I think you're much better off being honest uh, and transparent, whether it's in your interpersonal re uh, interactions or in your professional and, and, and ambitions. Um, people are very smart. Everybody can tell when someone is playing a role. Um, no. And then that's just not, no matter how good you are pretending, someone will find you out. Uh, <clears throat> we're coming towards the final segue of the, of the podcast. Mm -hmm. How do you learn new things today? Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm old, so I still learn by going to books. Um, I give myself one or two hours every week to go to the bookstore. And I look around, I, I might not even buy a book, but usually because I'm addicted to books, I will buy it. Uh, and, and that's how I learn. I, I go to a bookstore and I see new things. Um, I have learned to use the web. Um, and, but the trick is not just the, the source of, of the knowledge, it's formulating your own question. And I learn new things by being perpetually curious. I'm fascinated by how things work. Uh, societies, societies, a, a diversion of an engineer. Uh, of my attitude is the engineer who as a child took apart radios um, because they want to see what the inside works. Right. Um, I learn through curiosity. I, I don't set myself goals of I'm going to learn this language or I'm going to learn this skill or I'm going to learn this because I can use it for something else. I, I learn it because I really want to learn that, I, I want to know more about whatever it might be. The joy of learning, sort of. The joy of learning, the joy of, of just, uh, it, it's the same joy as reading a, 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 a new piece of fiction. Something you didn't know before, a story you didn't know before, a narrative you didn't know before, a set of words that you had never heard before. Uh, that is so satisfying. Um, for and I'll give you the the, the an, another example. I'm never bothered by delayed planes or delayed trains or whatever. <laughs> That's so refreshing to hear. I, I I don't because I always have a book. And yes, it's inconvenient. 
you, the plane doesn't come, you don't get to your meeting, you, you know, whatever. Yes, that's, but as long as you have a book <laughs> or book equivalent, um, you can take those three, four, five hours sitting in an airport or sitting in a rail station or whatever it might be and go away from those three or four hours and enter the Roman Empire or enter the mind of a great philosopher or enter a fiction or enter a comic book, whatever it might be. But you enter into a different world and you now have a set of images and a set of narratives that you didn't have before, an hour before. You're wealthier an hour later because you've read something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if I might add, uh, the gift of stillness. Yes. Pico Ayer talks about uh, yes. how living around, and there was this one woman at the airport in a, when, when the flight was delayed, who just said, greeted uh, her fellow passenger, and then sat there doing nothing for 10 hours. Yes. The joy of stillness. The, which, which is increasingly difficult. Um, I think I, I have an, uh, an Apple iPhone, and I use it obsessively. I think one of the worst things about it is that it's taken away the sense of you just waiting in line and you, you take a breath and you notice the clouds or you notice the smells around you. No, what do we do when we're waiting in line now? We pick up our phone and we read some useless news uh, about something. We've lost that art of just... The joy of discovering. The, the joy of discovering, but also the joy of quiet. Yeah. The joy of, of not doing anything. Uh, I, I think, again, you have to move. Very few people are so privileged that they can enjoy a purely meditative life. I think uh, uh, Gandhi at one point said that it took a lot of resources to allow him to live so poor. Um, yeah. Stillness is a luxury because you, you're not producing. You're not... We've lost that. We've lost the, that luxury of just contemplation uh, and not about anything important. Maybe it's just the shape of your finger. Um, but just slow down. Uh, and we're we're um, there's a, this is not a famous philosopher there's a there's a very famous comic strip in the United States called Peanuts and one of the character they're children and one of the characters asks the other one uh, where are we going and the second one goes I don't know and the first one says so why are we going so fast um, and I think that's a good thing from, <laughs> from a child's perspective if you're not sure where you're going, why are you going so fast? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> um, you know, on this, on this beautiful note of uh, the joy of discovery, mm -hmm. joy of stillness, uh, I know you've thought about it. What's the evolving role of a university? Is it a certificate granting institution, bite-sized knowledge, mm -hmm. which, which is in vogue these days, lots of articles are written about it, or is it something deeper? What's your take? I think it's much some, it's, it has to be something deeper. If, if you are thinking about a, an industrial production of knowledge or you're thinking about industrial distribution of knowledge, no university can compete with Google. Google has every answer to every question within five seconds. So universities can't be about that. Universities, I think, have two roles, a social role, which is to certify that someone has a set of skills. Um, universities, in a sense, serve to provide signals to the world. Someone has gone to a university, um, someone has acquired a set of skills. That's a signaling process, and that you can't avoid that. And society needs signaling processes. Society needs certification saying, yes, I know this. More important is that universities are these privileged places where contemplation is encouraged, where thought is encouraged, and non, not necessarily productive thought, where thinking in and of itself 
is 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 privileged and we're speaking in and of itself is privileged and where you have a small community for a few years where everyone is doing the same thing and it encourages a development it encourages uh, uh, it encourages a a, a a development not only of your mind but of your soul that is invaluable now it turns out that that same process which is very valuable for an individual also ends up and study after study after study shows us um, that ends up being more important for life success and professional success than being a walking Google you're walking Google fine but what do you add you simply know what is known if you pick up these sets of skills if you pick up this process of contemplation if you pick up that rigorous mode of thought then you can produce new things, you can produce new knowledge, you can produce new ways of doing things. And that's what's professionally, I think it personally is gonna be much more satisfactory, but professionally is gonna be much more satisfactory. Um, uh, 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 you know, I, 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 when we talked earlier, I told you about this friend of mine when I was in college who was very instrumental about what he wanted to study. He was studying Farsi, and he was studying petroleum engineering. And he was- Farsi American. and petroleum engineering. He was, this is in the 1970s in college. And he, he thought of himself, this is perfect. I'll be a petroleum engineer who speaks Farsi. I'll make lots of money. And then the Iranian revolution happened. And all of a sudden the idea of an American petroleum engineer in Iran was not possible. <laughs> well, I think we have to be very careful about that. Be very careful about just learning something to have this particular skill. Because you might guess wrong. Um, we often do. We often do. We, we, we think we want X. And then it turns out we didn't want X after all. Or X becomes irrelevant. Uh, I mean, this has happened certainly in the last 30 or 40 years. Let's say that all your life, um, what you wanted to do was to be a travel agent. And you acquired a set of knowledge and a set of skills in order to be a travel agent. Well... Five years, let's say around 1990, 1995, that stopped being a business. Yeah, that stopped being a job. That stopped being a job. And if you've trained all your life for that, if you've trained all your life to be this particular product, that product may become irrelevant. Um, you can train all your life to be a candle maker, and then all of a sudden, nobody wants candles anymore. Yeah. Um, so you want to train yourself and you want to train your life so that you can adapt. You, 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 know, you don't just know one thing, you know lots of things. And you, more important than knowing lots of things is knowing how to learn lots of things. That's, I think that's, that's, the, that's the biggest skill to have. Right. And last question. Yeah. Um, if Adam Smith took a walk in the 21st century, <laughs> what would be his initial reflections? Oh my gosh. Big question, short yeah, answer. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I know I'm putting you on a spot here, but let's no, see. No, I think I, hmm. we always think of of, uh, of 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 Smith as the wealth of nations. Um, let's do Smith and Marx, if that's okay. <laughs> uh, Marx, I think, would sit around, given his biography, being very self satisfied because we lived in a, we live in a Marxian world. Uh, if you read the Communist Manifesto, every time. He says bourgeoisie, just substitute globalization. And you see that globalization, the logic of globalization and the incentives to globalization have taken over. Smith, uh, again, we forget that Smith, for example, has this uh, a, a wonderful treatment of empathy. Um, I think he would be saddened that many of the social norms, many of the social structures that he assumed would remain even as we pursued our self-interest. I think he would be shocked how many of them have left. And I think he would caution us that, yes, the pursuit of self-interest can be very efficient, but it can't be everything. Dr. Centeno, this has been a pleasure. It'll go out to 100,000 people around the world, and I'm sure they'll learn a ton from this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.